So this is just telling you my background. I got my, you saw this on one of Barbara's slides that I did my PhD with Joe Gall, um, who has, considers himself, just like many of you here, consider yourself geneticist, capital G, geneticist. Uh, Joe was a capital C cell biologist. And I learned to love chromosomes in Joe's lab. But I think of them as structures, which is really different than the way geneticists think about them. And I've worked a lot on the structures like the origins of replications, the ends of chromosomes, telomeres, and just recently centromeres, which I'm going to tell you about. So um, I, here's the rest of my uh, list of where I've been. And I guess the reason I'm here is because I spent two years as a postdoc here um, in Walt Fangman's lab. And after that, I went to the Hutch and became a faculty member and stayed affiliated with the Department of Genetics. This was before it became Genome Sciences, um, until I moved to Princeton in 1995. So um, in my opinion, the genetics department was just, so I've been in a lot of departments, a lot of good departments. There's something really, really special about the genetics department. And in preparing this talk, I tried to think about the different things that made it such an incredible place to work, to be both a scientist and a mentee uh, by the people here. And one of the things that made it a great department was that there was a great leader. The founder of the department, Herschel Roman, is pictured here. This is a picture courtesy of Ann Roman, who sent it to me a couple days ago. I met and less than a year ago, and I sort of see Herschel somewhere smiling as he looks at the two of us becoming friends. Herschel, um, we all know Herschel was a great scientist. Some people think of him as the father of yeast genetics. Um, but he really also uh, generated an atmosphere in the department that made it a really great place to work. And it was especially a good place as a postdoc. Because in most departments, as a postdoc, you're sort of on the periphery. You know, graduate students are embraced or part of the whole thing. And postdocs, they come and go. And they're often not well known by other faculty members other than their mentor. So um, I worked on the first floor in Walt Fangman's lab. And Herschel's office and lab were on the second floor. And a few months after I came to the department, I was walking by his office, and he said, oh, come on in. You know, you're Ginger Zakian, right? Which was amazing to me that he knew my name. And he said, I really like to get to know all the postdocs, and I'm wondering if we could just have a talk um, so that we could get to know each other better. Well, it was a gr from my perspective, it was a great talk. We learned that we both loved opera. We learned um, that we both loved a book called The Last of the Just, which and what really impressed me, I had read it in English, but he was reading it in French. Um, and it was just this great talk. Uh, over the two years that I was in the department, we were not only colleagues, but friends. And that was despite the fact that I was working on two micron DNA, which kind of offended him, because at that time, it didn't have a phenotype. And if you're in a genetics department, you don't work on something that doesn't have a phenotype. And at the end of every one of my yeast meetings, he'd say, do you have a phenotype yet? <laughs> um, because I stayed in Seattle for the 16 years after being in the department, Herschel and I remained friends. One of the things is he took me out to lunch every year at a nice restaurant. But he did this on one condition that I let him pay for it. He said, Ginger, I know you're a feminist, but I can't go out to lunch with a female if I don't pay for it. So, um, so Herschel, I think, was a great chair and helped create an atmosphere that was um, a good place to work. Oops, I forgot I'm not using that. Um, so, and then I also had a great postdoc advisor uh, and good friends uh, that I made as a result of being in Walt Fangman's lab. Here he is in um, May 1978. I was uh, nearing the end of the time of my lab. And in his lab, I learned that you didn't have to be able to see a chromosome in order to love it. Um, and I still think, I don't care what all you Drosophilites say in the audience, 
yeast is the best experimental <laughs> system. And I still really believe that. Um, he had a, a, a lab of uh, interactive and fun to be with people. And um, one of the best was Bonnie Brewer, who uh, became a friend and colleague then, and remains a friend and colleague. And what I've always admired, among other things, about Bonnie is her ability to think in 3D. Um, Walt Fangman retired in 2004, and there was a symposium for him, and this was the title of my talk, and it's actually true. Everything, I run my lab the way Walt ran his lab. I, again, I had been in a few labs, and there was absolutely clear that Walt had perfected the way to run a lab. And I think if Bonnie would come visit me in my lab in Princeton, she'd know exactly where to look for uh, the pipette tips and things like that. Uh, here's Walt at his retirement party. And just to indicate some of the fun we had, well, we did science. We, we took our science very seriously, but we also enjoyed it. So this is the acknowledgments in a paper that um, was a collaboration between Bonnie and Walt and me. OK, so now to the subject of this meeting. So um, I worked on yeast, and I was a postdoc. So you might think I didn't know Larry, but Larry, infused by and, and in part having created the atmosphere of this, the department, this very interactive department, also sought out the lowly postdocs and had conversations with them. Um, this is a picture from an article that's on the website. And if you haven't read this, this is uh, written by Dave Stadler. And it's just a wonderful article. And you'll learn a lot. And you'll also, this is what Larry looked like, what I remember Larry looking like. Um, now, of course, I forget what I was going to say about Larry. Oh, so I know. OK, so it's been discussed here that Larry was a great teacher, great speaker. And I really admired this about him. And so one day, I was just saying to him, telling him this. I said, Larry, you know, it's just amazing. You can just get up, you speak in flowing, complete sentences. You use the word albeit in sentences, which I really liked. <laughs> and it's just so spontaneous, and, and yet no ums, nothing like that. It was perfect. And he said, it wasn't spontaneous. I practiced all my talks multiple times in front of a mirror. And I was just amazed, because you would never have known it, because he was such a natural. But of course, that gives the budding scientists a uh, hope for themselves for the future for the kind of talks they might give. So I'm going to tell you two Larry stories before um, going on to a little bit of science. So the first uh, is related to Demosthenes, which, as everybody knows, that Plutarch called one of the greatest orators of ancient Greece. And what uh, the story we probably all remember about him is that he, in fact, was not a good speaker when he started out. He had some speech defect. And he practiced his oratory by talking with marbles in his mouth. I also learned in, when I was trying to find a picture, well, a sort of a picture of Demosthenes, <laughs> that uh, like Larry, he practiced his talks in front of mirrors. So this is a little story about Larry and uh, oratory. So. Um, one day, while I was a postdoc, Larry called me, asked me if I could come up and talk to him. So I came up, sat down in his little office, and um, he said, uh, I have a student who's, I think, has real talent and real ability. But I'm afraid he's not going to uh, fulfill his um, abilities because he doesn't give very good talks. And I've been working with him on this. And I've tried this, and I've tried that, sort of kind of standard academic solutions, and none of them work. He said, and I learned that your husband is in theater. My husband, Bob, uh, is a writer, director, and sometimes actor. And he said, it occurred to me that maybe through your husband, we could get him into an acting class, or even better, into a play. So I got him in touch with Bob, and they uh, made plans about this. Now, I don't know if the student of his ever did act in a play, but I can tell you this person is not only a really fine scientist, but actually gives very good talks. And what I learned from this is that Larry 
uh, would go that extra mile for mentoring a student. He didn't just think, you know, are your data reproducible? Did you do this? Did you do that? He actually cared about the whole person, and he wanted his people to succeed. So that's my first story. My second story occurred uh, very soon after I started my lab at the Fred Hutch. I was very excited because I had been asked to write a news and views for Nature on a uh, full-length article written by Louise Clark and John Carbon, who had fairly recently isolated the yeast centromere. So this was you know, using the tools of molecular biology to ask really wonderful questions about chromosomes. And in this paper, uh, they showed that centromeres, this, the identity of a chromosome was not determined by its centromere. They could invert the centromere, the chromosome behaved fine. They could replace the centromere of chromosome three with the centromere of chromosome 11, and it was fine. I was really excited about this paper. And so for some, I, I don't know, remember how it happened, but I was in Larry's office, and you know, maybe he was saying, so what are you doing these days? And I'm telling him, I'm writing this article, and how what an amazing set of experiments was, and how much fun I'm having. And when he told me what they had accomplished in the paper, he said, but that was done in Drosophila years ago. <laughs> and um, <laughs> in fact, I think probably the paper that um, Danny was referring to, the 1936 paper by Sturman and, and Beetle, shows that inversion doesn't change centromere identity. And a paper by Larry in, um, published in, I think it's 1956, yeah, 1956, shows that replacing the centromere doesn't change the identity. And Larry said, I thought this was such an uninteresting result and so well known that this would be the case that he didn't even publish it in a regular journal. He, he published it in DIS. So on there, hmm. So what did I learn from this? I learned that it's always good to know the history of science, and I'm sure Iris would agree with that. And um, I loved my, my own, Joe Gall was a person who was very well versed in the history of science. And I find that, uh, you know, thinking about where, the, you know, the the history of a given problem and how it's moved and the way people have approached it and the way they found answers is always enlightening for thinking about your next experiment, almost always enlightening. The other thing I learned was just because someone used the latest techniques of molecular biology didn't mean it was important. So those were two good lessons to learn from Larry. And um, I have to say I really benefited from being his friend and colleague. So my lab works on telomeres, the ends of chromosomes. As I said, I'm interested in structures. And we also work on replication fork progression. And we mostly work with budding and fission yeast. That being said, the little story I'm going to tell you today is really a story about centromeres, which I chose um, because we, we really don't work on centromeres yet. This year we'll have two papers on centromeres. It just sort of happens that way sometimes. And I chose centromeres because of the last story I told you of Larry's uh, telling me how uh, that the, these results in the Clark and Carbon paper were not as amazing as I thought. So this story starts because of a gene called PIF1, which is one of my favorite genes which was discovered by Vin Schultz when he was a postdoc in my lab. He did a screen, and, and this was here in Seattle. He did a screen for genes that affect telomere function. And he um, found the gene PIF1. In fact, it was the only really good gene he got out of the screen, which was a disappointment because PIF1 was already known. It was known, first of all, to be a DNA helicase, and it was known to be required for maintenance of mitochondrial DNA. And as you know, telomeres are in the nucleus. Um, and it had no known nuclear activity. But um, Vince was able to show that PIF, in his, he, what he did was he generated separation of function alleles, an allele that went only to the nucleus and an allele that went only to the mitochondria. And he was able to show that effects on telomeres were not a secondary consequence of a mitochondrial deficiency. And so PIF1 inhibits telomere lengthening and de novo telomere addition to double-stranded breaks, a form of DNA repair that the cell really wants to avoid because it results in aneuploidy, 
for everything distal to the break. So over the years, we, um, and we indicate these three postdocs who worked on the problem of the mechanism by which PIF1 uh, inhibits telomere lengthening. And in this first me mechanism paper in, published in 2000, they showed that the effect of PIF1 is on telomerase, not on re recombinational lengthening. That was a very exciting result in the time because this was the period when people were just realizing that there's a link between telomerase and cancer. So to have a natural inhibitor of telomerase was pretty exciting. In this paper, we showed that it acted catalytically, and it also acts directly. PIF1 binds to telomeres at the same time that telomerase acts at telomeres. And finally, Vince showed that PIF1 was the founding member of a family of helicases, which we now know are virtually ubiquitous in eukaryotes. The next mechanism paper, which is perhaps my favorite of my papers, you're never supposed to say that about your children, but I think you can say it about your papers, which is uh, work that was done by postdoc Jean-Baptiste Boulet and uh, Letty Vega. And I think what I like about this paper is that we showed the mechanism of PIF1 activity both using in vitro assays and in vivo assays. So uh, what they did together is to show that PIF1 uses its helicase activity to evict telomerase from DNA ends, and it can do that in vivo and it can do it in vitro. Uh, a, few, a few years later, a postdoc, Katrin Peschke, uh, teamed up with Jane Phillips, a graduate student in the lab, to show that PIF is a really smart enzyme because it preferentially binds to and removes telomerase from long telomeres, which of course don't need to be lengthened by telomerase. It doesn't do it to the short telomeres, the ones in need of lengthening. Okay, so PIF is a very interesting enzyme, but uh, before Vince left my lab, he discovered that there was, that yeast encoded a second PIF1 gene that was 40% identical to PIF1 in its helicase domain, and that's called RM3. And of course, we first thought that they would have overlapping functions, but when we first studied them, and this has changed, as you'll hear, over the last couple years, we thought they had very distinct functions. And specifically, a large number of, um, a lot of work from a large number of people in the lab, but spearheaded by postdoc Andreas Ivesa, using a technique that was developed by Bonnie Brewer uh, here in the Genome Sciences Department. It was a technique that was first um, developed by Leslie Bell when she was a graduate student in Breck Byers Lab when I was a postdoc here, which is 2D gels to separate nonlinear molecules from linear molecules of the same mass. And uh, uh, Leslie and Breck's group used that to look at recombination, whereas Bonnie was able to uh, think of ways to adapt it so it could be used to study DNA replication. And these are the kinds of 2D gels that you can see with the method. We're looking here at a specific centromere. Even in a wild-type cell, you get pausing at the centromere. That was first seen by Carol Newlon, who's a former Fangman postdoc. And that's also true at tRNA genes. Carol realized there was modest pausing at tRNA genes. That is, the fork is having trouble moving through those structures. But you can see in an RM3 delete cells, that pausing becomes much worse. So with um, the work of primarily Jessica Bessler, Bessler and Jorge Torres, two graduate students, we learned that it was stable protein complexes that render a site sensitive to RM3. Anna Asvalinsky, when she was a graduate student, showed that RM3 moves with the replosome. It moves through it, whether the, uh, through all sites in the genome, even sites that are not to our knowledge, sensitive to the presence of RM3. But when it hits a hard to replicate site, it helps the fork move past that site by using its helicase activity. This makes RM3 an accessory DNA helicase, the first uh, member of that class to be discovered in a eukaryote. So you can think of RM3 as acting as sort of a snowplow to uh, remove things ahead of it. Now, 
Um, one of the things we, I said that RM3 moves with the replosome. PIF behaves quite differently than that. PIF's abundance is cell cycle regulated. It peaks in late SG2 phase, and it gets recruited to its sites of action. Okay, so um, through the years, we, realized, we started doing more and more biochemistry, and we began to investigate the properties of the PIF1 helicases, specifically PIF1 and the fission use version of it, PFH1, because RM3 is unfortunately very hard to purify. So this work was uh, really begun by Jean-Baptiste Boulet, a postdoc in the lab, who did the work on PIF1. Now, Seem Sabori, also a postdoc in the lab, started working on the fission yeast enzyme, but in vivo studies. And now in her own lab in Sweden, she has um, done the same kind of biochemical studies on PFH1, the POMB homolog that JB did first with the budding yeast. So um, first of all, all the PIF family helicases are just terrible at unwinding a conventional DNA substrate. If you give it duplex DNA with a five prime single stranded tail, it can unwind maybe two base pairs and then it falls off. But if you give it G quadruplex DNA or an RNA DNA hybrid, it unwinds them really well. So G quadruplex DNA is an unusual non Watson Crick structure held together by GG base pairs. And GG base pairs are more stable than any of the canonical base pairs. So these can be very stable structures. Here you see PIF1 moving forth to encounter a G4 structure, which it can um, unwind. And Katrin Peschke showed that PIF1 and Nassim showed PIF H1 actually promote fork progression and suppress G4-induced DNA damage in vivo. Matt Bachman contributed to the biochemistry. The other unusual property of PIF1 in vitro, which was discovered in the Galetto lab at Wash University, is that PIF also displaces protein from DNA. And our working hypothesis is that all, so it turns out uh, with more work, you find out that PIF1 especially is very multifunctional. It does many things. I'm not going to tell you about all of them. But, um, we believe that all of its activities are uh, possible because of these three biochemical activities. The ability to unwind G4 DNA, this is these, the ability to displace RNA from DNA, that would be an R loop. If you, those of you who are aware of R loop mediated genome instability and pushing proteins off DNA. Okay. so. Um, at some point, we started using genome-wide approaches to identify uh, sites of PIF1 and RM3 action. And actually, Mitzi came and gave a seminar at Princeton, which really influenced the direction we were going. We had been doing everything with ChIP-seq, and she showed that ChIP-chip, I'm sorry, we had been doing it with ChIP-chip, and she showed that there was a much larger dynamic range with ChIP-seq. And because of that insight, my group de developed ChIP-seq at Princeton, and learn new things that we hadn't known. Thank you, Mitzi. We're all connected in this great world here. So um, Chi Fu Chen has pioneered using ChIP-seq uh, for looking at PIF1 binding sites and also the consequences, for example, on DNA pausing and DNA damage when you deplete cells of PIF1. And Sebastian Pott is our uh, computational collaborator. So here we're looking at all 16 nuclear chromosomes across here. And each spot indicates a site of PIF1 binding detected by ChIP-seq. And there are many binding sites for PIF1 on each of the yeast chromosomes. This chromosome indicated in red is the mitochondrial DNA. About 80% of the PIF1 is in mitochondria. Okay, so as a result of the ChIP-seq data, we found a bunch of binding sites. We put them into categories. Well, here we're looking at the percentage of a given category, this case G4s, that are bound by PIF1 in asynchronous cells. 35% of G4s, 95% of telomeres. Well, we already knew that. We already had a sense of what PIF1 does there. But there were two new sites, transfer RNA genes, which I'll call tDNAs, 35% of them are bound, and 100% of centromeres were bound, which is, was really quite um, surprising to us. So um, 
What I'm going to tell you, and I'm try to tell you very quickly, is that we've learned not only do PIF and ARM3 have unique functions, but they also have partially overlapping functions at G4, tDNAs, and SendDNAs. And the people indicated here have contributed to this. Katrin Peschke showed that ARM3 promotes replication through G4 motifs, but only in PIF delete cells. If um, PIF is there, ARM3 doesn't even show preferential binding to G4s. And PIF1 promotes replication of tRNA genes in centromeres, but only in the absence of ARM3. So PIF is a backup for ARM3. Part of these experiments were done by Tom, who was a former graduate student in uh, Bonnie and Raghu's lab. And in this paper here, Tal showed that ARM3 actually suppresses our R loop mediated DNA damage at tRNA genes. Okay, finally, I'm getting to centromeres. Okay, so here's the structure of the yeast centromere. The budding yeast centromere is often called a point centromere. It's really tiny. It's about 125 base pairs. And maybe you can only appreciate how tiny it is when you realize that even the palm bee centromere is 500 times larger than the budding yeast centromere. It has um, three structural regions. CDE1 is 8 to 10 base pairs. It's a binding site for a transcriptional regulator called CBF1. Both CDE1 and CBF1 are not essential, but if you delete either one of them, then the loss rate of the chromosome goes up 10 to 20 fold. These are the elements that I'm showing you here are present on all 16 yeast chromosomes. So the CDE2, which is the largest region, is uh, characterized and is important both for its size and for its being AT rich, although its exact sequence doesn't matter. And it is thought to be a uh, wrap around a centromere specific nucleosome where the canonical centromere histone H3 is replaced by a centromere specific variant called CSE4 in budding yeast, SENPA in humans. This is a universal feature of centromeres. I think it's uh, been seen in all eukaryotes that have looked for it. And um, CDE3, 26 base pairs, is bound by a four-protein complex, all the pro which is essential for recruiting the other kinetochore proteins. Okay, so I showed you PIF1. We already know ARM3 promotes replication through centromeres. So what does PIF1 do? We thought... Well, let's first see if its binding occurs at a specific time in the cell cycle. So we, um, here, when we always look at least three centromeres, I'm showing you just one. So as we anticipated, RM3, which is part of the replosome, binds centromeres early in S phase. We anticipated that because Bob McCarroll, when he was a graduate student with Walt Fangman, showed that centromeres replicate early in S phase. PIF1, in contrast, in a wild-type cell, binds in late S phase to the centromere. What uh, was particularly interesting to us, though, is the timing of binding of RM3 is affected in the absence of PIF1. So you still have good binding early in the cell cycle, but now the peak of binding has been shifted later in the cell cycle. And a similar pattern is seen for PIF1 in an RM3 delete. Still binds late but it's moving to earlier in the cell cycle. So this led us to the hypothesis that ARM3 and PIF1 have different functions at the centromere. ARM3 promotes replication, and PIF1 has an unknown function late in the cell cycle, but they also can partially substitute for each other, which changes their binding pattern. So now we wanted to figure out what is it that PIF1 does late in the cell cycle? And we speculated that it might have something to do with centromere RNA. And the reason we thought that is because I've already told you PIF1 unwinds RNA-DNA hybrids really, really well. So what is centromere RNA? It's defect detected in diverse organisms. It's probably a universal feature of centromeres. They're linked to the segregation function of centromeres, but there's not, in my opinion, Steve Hancock might differ with me on this, but there's no unifying model 
for how centromeres affect segregation. And part of the reason for this, for the lack of a clear model, is that there are not just centromere RNA involved in segregation, but in organisms that have large centromeres, like fission yeast in mammals, the centromere is heterochromatic, and there is RNA that is involved in establishing the heterochromatic region. And so it can be difficult to distinguish the effects of centromere RNA on heterochromatin from its effect on its centromere function. And the budding yeast centromere is not only small, but it's not heterochromatic and it's not repetitive. So we decided we were going to test the idea that PIF1 might affect centromere RNA. But first, we had to detect centromere RNA. There was one paper at the time that had detected centromere RNA and had found that CBF1 was needed to transcribe the centromere. It was the tra transcriptional activator. So in fact, Chi Fu found that CBF1 does affect the expression of centromere RNA, but at SEN3 in blue and SEN13 in red, here's the level of RNA in a wild type cell, which is extremely low. It's estimated at far fewer than one molecule of RNA per centromere per cell. The reason it's so low is not just that there's very little of the RNA, but that it exists in a very narrow window of the cell cycle, which I'll show you in a minute. But you can see that the level of SEN RNA increases 5 to 12 fold depending on um, the centromere. So CBF1 is an inhibitor, not an activator. So then we looked in synchronized cells. Here we're looking at SEN RNA, and we can see that it peaks at a uh, window sort of mid to late S phase. This is after the time of centromere replication, and that the increase in SEN RNA in a CBF1 delete cell is throughout the cell cycle. So um, at all stages, in this particular centromere, the overall increase in SEN RNA is almost sevenfold in the absence of CBF1. So if you look now in other mutant backgrounds, and I'll just show you one more of them, this is in a cell that lacks RNase H1. This is the dedicated RNase H that removes RNA in an RNA-DNA hybrid. It not only displaces it from the DNA, it degrades it. And what you can see is that there is an increase in SEN RNA in an RNase H1 delete, and this increase occurs mainly at the time that, that SEN RNA is normally made. It's not like in a CBF1 delete, where it's all throughout the cell cycle. And epistasis analysis, even though I'm not a real geneticist, I do use the word epistasis, albeit not that often. <laughs> but you can see that RNase H1 and CBF1 act by different pathways to affect um, the levels. And the same is true for PIF1 and RM3. So this tells us that SEN RNA is in R loops and also partly explains why it's so low abundance. Um, I think I'm going to, I feel like we're really running out of time here. So I'm just going to tell you that CBF1 binds, binding throughout the cell cycle is in agreement with it being a repressor because it comes off at the time that you see that the SEN RNA peaks almost embarrassingly closely. You can see they both peak at 45 minutes. OK, whoops. Sorry. Um, OK, so. The next thing we wanted to ask, yes. Well, I'm actually not over my 30 minutes. Well, anyway, this is my last slide. Last slide, last slide. CSC4 nucleosomes, it turns out, are loaded inaccurately in a CBF1 delete cell. And I won't show you all the data for it, but it's not simply the increase in RNA, it's the unscheduled synthesis. And the CBF1. Oops. The, any case, okay, so here's my summary, sorry. PIF1 assisted replosome, PIF RM3 assisted replosome replicates the centromeres in early S phase. Because CBF1 inhibits fork progression at centromeres, CBF1 is bound at the time of centromere replication. PIF1 binds in late S phase, I haven't shown you this, and it actually uses its helicase activity to displace CBF1 
from the centromere, and that allows one round of SEN RNA synthesis. The SEN RNAs are in R loops until they're removed by a combination of RNAs H1 or the PIF arm 3 helicase. And CBF1 quickly rebinds to prevent further centromere transcription. And if there's no CBF1 to limit send transcription to this narrow window, then you perturb the association of CSC4 with the nucleus with the uh, centromere, and you perturb chromosome instability. You perturb chromosome stability. So um, I again want to thank all of you for listening, and thank Larry for his wonderful um, example and all the people who've worked in my lab. Thank you.